John, obviously, uh, your workers are forbidden under law going on strike uh, to support these guys. But short of that, what can your union do to support the LIRR workers in the event of a strike? The Transport Workers Union Local 100 is under the New York State Taylor Law, as you noted. We have employment contracts with New York City Transit Authority, with MAPSTOA, and with MTA Bus, all entities of the MTA. We do not have a contract with the Long Island Railroad. We absolutely will refuse to work, to work on the Long Island Railroad. We will support this strike. The Taylor Law does not apply to TW Local 100 being ordered to work on the Long Island Railroad. In addition to that, we will support these picket lines and we'll do everything else in everything, everything else that's lawful to defend the Long Island Railroad workers and we're gonna fight this fight as if it's our own livelihoods on the line because the fact of the matter is, it is our livelihoods on the line. If the Long Island Railroad workers succeed, New York City Transit workers succeed. And if New York City Transit workers succeed, Long Island Railroad workers succeed. Despite your argument that the MTA is provoking this showdown and that the MTA may be the ones triggering the strike, if it actually happened, the public might not have so much sympathy for you guys. How concerned are you about that? Well, listen, I don't think there's any doubt that the MTA is provoking the strike, and it isn't as if folks in the, in the downstate region have a high opinion of the MTA to begin with. They don't. They realize that workers at the New York City Transit Authority and workers on the Long Island Railroad and workers on Metro North are the ones that get them back and forth to work every day. It isn't the bosses that get them back and forth to work. It's the unions that get, back, that get them back and forth to work. We're the ones who are living in communities, and we are confident that when the facts come out, that the riders will stand with us against the MTA. John has made a very good point. For the first time, I mean, this is the largest commuter rail in the Northeast, okay? We are gonna, the economic impact is gonna be phenomenal. Okay, for everyone. And at this point, we have finally seen a change in that the riding public, you, you look at Hurricane Sandy. We were with that. We got these rails back up and, and, and running. We were out of our houses. We were homeless. There were members sleeping in their cars to get these rails back up. The riding public is also seeing that we're accepting recommendations that are less than what we asked for. We're accepting them. We're going to take it on the chin as well so we don't have to inconvenience them. We're starting to get frontline conductors, ticket clerks, and, and all frontline employees in transit finally hearing from the public. We had a, a, somebody say to us this morning that the riding public is starting to get it. They're understanding. You're ready to move on, not cause a strike. That congressional letter said that. Stop causing this issue, and we would move on. They took a congressional letter to stop a strike, and from labor. So the riding public is getting it. They're getting it, I hope. I hope more of them get it and understand that it's not us that wants this. It's not the TWU leadership who wants it. It's not the membership that wants it. Let's, let's move on. Let's get back to business. Commuting. Let's get back to 285,000 commuters a day, taking them into the city without disrupting the system. Well, what John and Anthony are both on the mark, the other side of that coin is I have never seen an employer do what MTA has done before even the first PEB, which is to go public and threaten, basically to hold the public hostage, to really try and, and mobilize the public against our members, the workers, by every day screaming, well, first they were gonna double fares, then it was triple fares, now it's quadruple, next week it'll probably be 50 times the way they're going. They are consciously trying, their strategy is not to bargain, it's to try and you know, whip up public support against us. It's gonna fail. The only way we get out of this is if they come back to the table and accept that PEB report. But they are doing their best to do exactly what you said, which is turn the public against us. Yes. Uh, you have a bipartisan congressional letter. Would you be seeking a motion to state delegation as well? Absolutely, okay. Senator. We will be coming, as I spoke to Senator Flanagan as well, and to Senator Skelos, uh, and he has shown his support as well as everyone here. We're going to sit down and do a briefing for the Senate as well. And thank you for coming. Anybody else? Yes? 
They're saying that they want work rule change at the MTA. That's really like their bottom line. Why can't you work on that? I, I, you know, like what are you dead set against any work? We have a hundred years of bargaining, and to get those work rules, it took us a hundred years of givebacks to get them. They now want to pay dollar for dollar. So the board recognized if you're going to pay dollar for dollar for these work rules, why are we going to address it? It doesn't save you any money. And these work rules that they're talking about, that the problems are, it's management, mismanagement. If they learn how to manage their work rules, we wouldn't be here discussing work rules. Right. Okay? Yeah. They have no problem in these past snowstorms calling every one of us in to work overtime constantly so that we can clean these rails. Where were they? They were on the third floor, nice and warm with their heaters on. Our track workers were out in the, on the steel. You know how cold that steel is? Clearing these rails. Let's call it what it is. Stop turning the public against us. We want to work. We want to stay there and provide service. The work rules are not causing the problem. It's management who's causing the problem. Yes. The other thing on that is they made that case, they tried to make that case <laughs> at the Presidential Emergency Board. And this Presidential Emergency Board, the people on it have, when, when a legitimate case has been made in the past to a Presidential Emergency Board for work rule changes, they recommend it. They looked at their demands and concluded they were without merit. You can read the report. Um, we're not gonna relitigate that. Um, they, that was their position. Um, the other thing, we keep reading in the papers, it's sort of confusing to us about the major work rule they're seeking is something to do with um, locomotive engineers, and locomotive engineers aren't even in bargaining. Uh, they're not part of the Presidential Emergency Board, they're not at the table, so the, the, the work rule they use is their PR example of this um, onerous work rule is not even on the table, which is again, I think, exemplary of, of the kind of bad faith we've been dealing with. I just want to add one thing to that. There's a process laid out by the federal government on how to resolve labor disputes on the railroads, on commuter railroads. Both parties went through the process. The MTA had every opportunity to argue for the changes that they wanted to see in the contract, and the union did as well. And the contract came out as a split decision. The MTA got things they wanted, and the union got some things they wanted, but it wasn't perfect for everybody. And at the end of the day, the MTA loves to dispute arbitration decisions that they don't like, but they love to implement arbitration decisions that they do like. And you can't have it both ways. They, they, had, they had their chance to make fair arguments to an arbitration panel. They failed. The results of the panel have now been made public. They need to accept the results of the panel and end this labor dispute once and for all in the fairest manner possible, which is to accept the recommendations of an expert panel of federal arbitrators. Thank you. mention one thing. The MTA has an entire floor dedicated to their attorneys. An entire floor. They're on salary. Yet they go out and spend millions on a top law firm to attack labor in this PEB. What are all of those lawyers on the, the third floor, wherever it is, doing while they're hiring million dollar law firms to fight something that they know they've lost with this particular firm over and over again? That's your dollars, that's your money that they're claiming they're trying to save you. <laughs> All right, anybody else have any other questions before we wind it down? Yes. How, how, many, how many years are we without a contract right now? Anthony? June 15, 2010, our contract expired. June 15, 2010. Correct. So when the MTA tells us at, at hearings that they don't have the money to pay these back wages, the only thing I, I'd like to ask is this is something we can do legislatively so that when there is no contract, that a certain amount of money must be put in like an escrow account until the contract gets settled so that they would never not be able to not have the money. They, they actually had, um, this was in part of the PB record, uh, they had set aside money um, in 10, 11, 12 for uh, what they called cost of living, but it was 2%. Um, they spent it. So you could tell them to do it, but they had it, and they spent it. They also just, as you know, made a deal with the police that was fully retroactive, three years, 7% retroactive, and they're not talking about fair increases, and somehow they found the money. So, you know, 
don't, on one hand, they don't have the money. On the other hand, they just made a contract where they do have the money. None of the stuff that the police, that the MTA says is a concession is retroactive. So that 7% of retroactive wages is not net zero because there's nothing on the other side of that. It's 7% gain. And the only other element to that is that the MTA's budget is simply not an economic document. At the end of the day, it's a political document filled with political choices, and those choices, just by sheer coincidence, get ugly for railroad and transit workers when it's contract time. They make political determinations to put the money elsewhere and then make claims that they don't have money to pay out raises to their workforce. Yes? Um, if not through fare increases, where, where should or can the MTA find the money? Go ahead. First of all, they, they talk about the capital and their funding. Look at their capital program. They're late, constantly. They're always adding ads and millions and billions of dollars. Their advisors, apparently, are not advising them correctly. Their strategy has been dead wrong. Their money is not going into proper places because they don't want to reward the workers, but yet they want to reward high-paying salaries at the MTA. And the capital program says you can you can have a state of good repair and use that money for a state of good repair they want it all they want to, they can maintain a state of good repair and use some funding to recognize the workforce they're choosing not to do it but you see the agency presidents presidents have no problem taking their fifty six thousand dollar back pays and three hundred thousand dollar a year salaries okay on top of house allowances i mean that's a slap in the face you can't say and I, listen i think everybody deserves a fair wage increase, whether you're management or not, okay, that's great. But what about the working people who are out there? The capital funding is what they choose to make it. When they want to find money, they find it. When they want to find money to do what they have to do for their pet projects, they find it. Now they're, they're east side access, where is it? How many years behind are we? How many times have they had a question, the people that they used over in Metro North, they brought over to use for the city, they brought over to use on Long Island Railroad, we're using the same, we're recycling. The same people that are milking them and delaying projects that are costing us money. But it's labor's fault. We're not milking you. We're out there in the cold. We're doing what we have to do. Uh, base salary on Long Island, if, you, if you're looking at $65,000 a year on a base salary and you want to pay eleven dollars and $12,000 on the island in taxes and put your kids through school, I don't think $65,000 cut it. I really don't. So stop talking about what we're making because of the overtime that you're giving us because you need to run a railroad. 